All right. Hello, everyone who's watching the recording. Uh, so today is about Rust. We're going to talk about Rust and give you an introduction of it. So welcome to Rust. You'll notice we have a nice mascot. Uh, this is called Ferris. It's the Rust Station, um, as it's called. You'll see uh, it pop up in different places in the documentation. And yeah, Ferris is just kind of fun. So welcome to Rust. So what is Rust? Well, there's a couple of different examples. I mean, we can pick any of these, right? You got rusty cars, rusty tools, bunch of rust that just forms on stuff. You got all kinds of rust. Um, this is obviously not great, but it's not what we're talking about, so it's not our problem. Now, notice that production quality transition into this slide, right? Now, let's talk about Rust the programming language. And you can see that R there is a Rust logo. So Rust the programming language is very different from Rust everything else. So Rust is a multi-paradigm system programming language. And so what that means is that programming paradigms um, to define that is categorizing programming languages based on their features, right? So there are different types of paradigms that can be used. Some are imperative, some are object-oriented, some are functional. There are different ways to have a programming language. Then the multi-paradigm part means that it can do multiple different things. So there's functional Rust, but there's also object-oriented Rust, and there's also imperative Rust. So you can use those in a combined manner. And then finally, systems programming languages are languages for systems programming. I know, crazy idea. But systems programming is used for system software, whereas system software provides a platform for all the other software that's written elsewhere. So this is where something like a function to print something might be written. And it allows someone to write something that's much more lower level, much more higher performance, and much more easily done than if they were to write it in, say, Java and try to get that same performance. So, yeah, uh, systems pro uh, programming languages are designed to provide easy access to the underlying hardware and for performance. So Rust focuses on safety, and there's an asterisk. There's always an asterisk, isn't there? Every time I've talked, I've done a lecture on a programming language or an idea, there's always an asterisk. So Rust can be used both safely and unsafely. There's something called unsafe Rust, okay? And we aren't going to talk about that yet. I think we have a lecture on it. Um, and unsafe Rust is basically a more difficult version of Rust that takes a away a lot of the things that you would normally be used to having with Rust. So safe Rust is the true Rust programming language. That is a direct quote from Rust's uh, documentation. So everyone basically uses safe Rust unless you can't, which is very rare. So safe Rust will still allow you to write high performance applications, but you don't have to worry about things like memory safety or type safety as you would um, if you were writing a different language. Uh, so a key feature of Rust is that it makes concurrency safe, right? And so concurrency, allows an application to process multiple tasks at once and allows you to create highly efficient applications. Instead of just doing one thing, you can have your computer do two to however many things you want. And safe concurrency means that it's all easy to do without a lot of issues. So syntactically, Rust is pretty similar to C++, but safer because it has a lot of safety checks and other things that C++ does not. C++ will let you do pretty much whatever you want and just hope that you are doing the right thing. Whereas Rust will uh, basically check those things before it allows you to run them. So Rust has been voted the most loved programming language on the Stack Overflow developer service since 2016. And I lost my uh, slide uh, thing there. Okay. So yeah, Rust is one of the most popular languages out there. It has been for a while and it's very quickly gaining steam. So is Rust used anywhere, right? Uh, yes. The uh, first example is Dropbox. A lot of the big uh, core file systems in Dropbox are actually written in Rust because of its performance and safety. Another example is Yelp. 
Yelp developed a framework for real-time A-B testing in Rust, which is used across Welp. There is... Ah, production quality minus minus. Oof. Um, okay, but yeah, so Yelp allows for real-time A-B testing in which I, Rust is used to test if one feature ha is better than another. Mozilla uh, even has Servo, which is a parallel web browsing engine, and that's also written in Rust. I'm pretty sure I've heard Firefox is maybe making that uh, jump, but that, that I'm not 100% sure on. And then another example is Discord. Discord actually uses Rust in a variety of ways, and you can read more about that on a blog post. Um, but yeah, Discord even uses Rust. So, the basics. The easiest way to get into Rust is to read the documentation. So if we actually go to the documentation and I bring it over here, you're going to see that it has all kinds of very useful things and you can even do things like run code inside your browser. And this documentation is super useful and you're going to really like it if you take the time to get to know it. So. Let's bring back my slides. Okay. So yeah, the documentation is very, very important. Make sure to read it. I usually say this every other time, but this time it's super important because the Rust documentation is really, really good. Yeah, it's really well made. Um, someone said that in Twitch chat. So the documentation is very, very useful in learning the language and debugging. You can even run code snippets like I showed you. And the compiler is another very useful tool because it will actually help you. I know, crazy idea. A compiler actually telling you what's wrong instead of just saying this line. We'll, we'll show off some examples of that, but the Rust compiler is one of my favorite compilers. It will tell you exactly how to fix it. So, your first program, uh, we are going to talk about setup, files, all that kind of stuff, and then for the rest of the lecture, we'll be using mostly snippets uh, via a Rust online compiler that's given. So, yeah, as I said, we'll do most of the lecture in the playground, but I'm going to show you how to set it up. So, in order to install, just click on the link here. Um, it's in the documentation, and you can find exactly how to install it for your specific system. So, that's installation. Now, let's talk about your first program. Uh, is it really a compiler if it's helpful? Fair point. Um, I don't know. Depends on whether you actually want to be helped or not. Um, personal preference, I guess. Uh, so yeah, your first program, setup files, all that kind of stuff. So let's create one. So we're going to go over here and we're going to create test.rs on my desktop. And inside here we are going to create main and we are inside here going to do print line and then hello world and there we go so I'll go back to that syntax in a minute but in order to run it what we're going to be doing is we're going to use rust C and then the file name so what we're going to do is and as you can see up there is test.rs so if I do rust C test.rs it's gonna run and you're gonna see a bunch of stuff pop up for a moment and then here you go you now have this executable so the executable is basically a binary file that tells your processor exactly how to run it. So to run it, all we have to do is type dot slash and then test, and you'll see it's going to print out hello world for us. So this is very useful. It's very simple though, and there's a better way to do it. Because having to do that for every single one is going to be very difficult. Uh, yeah, I can, is that better? Let me know in the uh, chat if that's more visible. Perfect. All right. Um, so yeah, the executable file is basically binary instructions for how to how your specific computer can run it, and then use your source file to define Rust and then compile it in. Now the thing is, this is terrible for writing a large project, right? If you had to do this for a hundred files of Rust, and you had to do Rust C file a dot rs uh, I did that wrong rust c file a dot rs and then file b and so on that would take a very long time and would get very annoying so instead what we use is a thing called cargo so 
A very quick recap about our main function. I forgot to mention this. So let's go back into test.rs. So looking at this main function, I'm actually going to use uh, code uh, test.rs. So yeah, uh, looking at this function, I'm also going to make the text bigger there. Um, let me know if that's too small. I don't think that will be. Um, but yeah, so what this uh, does is it's a function called main. And so you'll notice this looks a little bit different from something like uh, Java. But basically, uh, you say this is a function using the fn syntax. Then you're going to give it a name. And the first one that you're going to, uh, like the first entry point for any Rust program is going to be a main function like this. Then you give parentheses, and we'll talk about arguments later. And then you put the brackets, and then inside you put whatever code you want to run. In this case, we're going to be using print line and then this exclamation mark, which means that it's a macro. And then we give it a string and end it with a semicolon. So as you can see, it's pretty familiar. It's got a few different things that make it a little bit easier to read, and we'll get into that. So it's a little bit like Python, but more like a Java or C style language. So that's a simple test um, Rust file. So as I said, the main function is unique because it's always going to run first. So looking at that, right, function defines the function, main is the function name, and then the parentheses are where we place the parameters, and we'll talk about that in, in a little bit. And then the function is surrounded by curly braces, and we have the print line in there. So the exclamation mark, as I said, is basically telling it that this is a Rust macro. So a function call would not use this exclamation mark, but because uh, Rust has these things called macros, you can call them by putting an exclamation mark. And so inside the macro, we pass hello world as an argument, and then end the line with the semicolon. So let's talk about cargo now. And no, we're not talking about cargo on a ship. We are talking about cargo, the uh, project management tool for Rust. So Cargo is Rust's build system and package manager. It can do all kinds of things. It can build your code, download libraries, build libraries, and all kinds of other things. Now, Cargo should be installed with Rust if you follow the installation in the documentation properly. So to double check, though, you can run this right here. So Cargo dash dash version, and you'll see I have Cargo 1.47, which is from back in uh, August which is probably out of date, but I haven't touched the installation in a while. Um, so creating a project, all you have to do is go to whatever directory you want to uh, put the project folder into, do cargo new and then the project name, and then it will create a directory. So let's do that. So first off, I'm going to remove uh, test.rs and test, and um, I'm going to clear that. Okay. so. We are going to do um, cargo new, and then we're going to do, um, we'll do project. So now you'll see there's a project folder here, and inside the folder, you're going to have cargo.toml. And we'll talk about that in a minute, but you have a source folder. So let's go inside there, uh, project, and then cd source, uh, cd, there we go. And so inside source, we have main.rs. And so if we open that up, uh, code, uh, actually, we go up a level, and then code dot. OK. So yeah, as we can see here, I'm actually going to make this a little bit smaller. Let me know if you can't see that. Um, this is just going to let us get everything on the screen. So yeah, function main looks exactly the same. It creates this just as um, you would see everywhere else. So in order to run it, though, uh, we do something a little bit different. So let's see. Um, also, you can set up Cargo to initialize a Git repository. Let's check that. So inside here, we're going to do Git status. And you're going to see, yes, it did create a uh, Git repository for us. So that's all good to know. And let's go on to the uh, next page. So looking at Cargo, right, we have this hello world function just like we did before. But there is one significant difference, and that is that we build it differently. So instead of creating uh, files and compiling them by using Rust C and so on and so forth, instead all we have to do is run cargo build. 
And so if we do that, uh, my mouse has disappeared on me. So cargo build. Now you'll see it's going to build and it's going to give us a warning uh, because I did not choose a correct name, but that's fine. Um, but if you look, you now have a target directory. Inside here we have debug and then inside here we have project. So this is a binary. So if we do dot slash target debug project, there we go, we get hello world. So that's great. It's still a little bad though, right? Because now we have to uh, run a cargo build and then dot slash for this executable. Now, instead what we can do is we can just use cargo run. So if I type cargo run, you're gonna see it's gonna build it just like before and I'm gonna change this to hello 196 so that it rebuilds. You're gonna see, there we go, hello 196 all in one thing just by doing cargo run. So yeah, that is sort of a basic example. I'm also going to um, recreate that so that we don't have the warnings for the rest of this. Uh, cargo new uh, project. All right, and so we are going to code project. I don't think we'll need that, but just in case. Um, so yeah, if I open that back up and cargo build, or cargo run, just to show that, there we go. It's going to compile and run, and we're good to go. So that is going to show us like how to build in a development environment. However, we can also take a look at cargo.lock. And so what this does is it keeps track of our repositories. So if I go in here, uh, you'll see we don't have any dependencies. We have a name called project, and then we have a version number. And so you can change that using cargo, and that's what you should be doing. But this basically keeps it all in one place for you to uh, be able to easily access. So don't worry about it because cargo will automatically update it each time. So now let's talk about cargo check. So cargo check will check if your code can compile, but it won't create an executable. Why would we do this? Because building your code is a way to check for errors and cargo build is going to take a long time. So instead we can use cargo check to check if all the syntax is good without actually building an executable. So let's do that. So inside here, I'm going to change this to, I'm going to remove the semicolon. And now instead of cargo build, I'm going to do cargo check and you're, and you're gonna see that that for some reason worked. Oh, I know why. Um, we're gonna remove the exclamation mark. That should cause an issue. Yeah, there we go. So now you're gonna see here, it's gonna say, hey, it expected a function, but it found a macro instead. And this isn't a function. You should be adding an exclamation mark. And this is what I was talking about when I said the Rust compiler is really good, right? It tells you exactly what line. It tells you exactly what it's freaking out about and then it tells you exactly how to fix it and it even gives you that code. So if you just copy paste this into here and rerun it, you're gonna see it compiles per, or it uh, checks it just fine and if we do cargo run now, you're good to go. I know, crazy. Uh, I can imagine there's a way to make an auto compiler where any of these compiler mistakes and the recommended fixes would automatically be added for you. But that is something for a different day. But yeah, this compiler is amazing. So that is cargo build and cargo check. Let's talk about build for release. So when you build a project in Rust, what you're actually doing is you're building a debug version. A debug version is going to be great um, for a cargo uh, or for a debugging or any type of um, working with your project, right? It's going to be slow, but it's going to be clear to you what's going on. And that's because it's not going to try to optimize it and apply different little tricks to make your code faster, but it means that when you're debugging, it'll be easier to debug. So instead of that, we can use cargo build dash dash release to make an optimized version. So if I do cargo build dash dash release, there we go. And now inside target, there's a release directory and inside here, we're gonna have that project. So if I do dot slash uh, release uh, or target release and then project, there you go. You see it runs. And in this case, it really doesn't matter because 
it's a very simple program, but in a bigger program that does actually add up to a lot of time saved. So yeah, you should only use cargo build dash dash release after you're done, but in the meantime, use uh, debug instead because you don't want to be releasing or you don't want to be trying to, to debug release code because it's much more difficult. So let's talk about variables and mutability. Let's talk about actual Rust now instead of just how to get it set up. So by default, variables are immutable in Rust. What this means is that once a variable has been assigned a value, it's forever. It's a forever variable, right? You are stuck with that variable. It is not changing. This is done for a couple reasons. The big one is safe concurrency. Rust places concurrency very high up on the priority list for good reason, because a lot of computers nowadays have a lot of threads and can't really be made much faster. Although that may be proven wrong in the future. But point being that as of right now, we're looking at computers that have higher core counts and can do more things at once but are able to do them pretty slowly. So concurrency is a great tool to be able to use very easily. So using immutable uh, variables is key because it makes concurrency safer and easier. So uh, let's talk about mutability, right? So we're gonna open up this snippet and I'm going to bring it over here. There we go, okay. So yeah, and once the uh, lecture slides come out later, you'll be able to access these too. Let me just open up Discord again. Okay. So yeah, looking at the uh, very or looking at this example, uh, we have a variable, and we're saying let. I'm also going to try and change the uh, size of this as well. Hopefully that's a little bit better. Um, I'm actually going to bring it down a little. Okay, there we go. So. What we have here is a function called main, and we have let change me equal five. And then we print the variable has a value of, and then change me. So if we run that, you're gonna see it's gonna work just fine. There we go, the variable has value of five. I can change this to 196, no questions asked, and we're good to go. So that's a pretty simple example. And as you can see, this is when it's built locally, you're gonna have the variable has value of five and you can see that down there. So let's take a look at this example. So I'm gonna open up this code snippet, which continues to open up on the other screen. So I'm gonna bring this back over here and close that one out. Okay, so looking at this one, we now have change me, and we have it as five, and then we set change me to 20. In the chat, does anyone have an idea of what is going to happen when we try to run this? That's an accurate way to put it. The compiler is going to cry. Um, as you can see, it's going to say, cannot assign twice to immutable variable change me. So let's talk about that. So this is what you would get if you did it locally. And so there are a couple important things here. So it tells us it cannot assign twice to an immutable value of change me. And so it shows us the first time we did it, and then it shows us the second time and puts these arrows saying, hey, you can't assign it twice here. So it's gonna tell us an error and it's going to tell us exactly where we can fix this. And so it'll say, first assign to change me and then make this binding immutable by putting mute change me. So let's go back over here and let's do exactly that. We are going to make it uh, mutable by doing this. And now if we run it, it's going to work completely fine. And you can see that in this example right here, uh, it's gonna work just fine. Pretty cool, and this also indicates to program to other people that the mute that this variable is mutable and may change in the future. So you can't rely on this value being uh, perfectly stable. So yeah, that's mutability in a nutshell. And if you look, we get a good output this time. And you can see down there highlighted. Okay, let's talk about shadowing, because this is where things get crazy. You can declare a variable with the same name as a previous variable. This would cause other compilers to freak out. In Rust, it's fine. So what shadowing does is it basically tells the compiler to 
let this specific function just move on and put it in a different piece of memory and just point to that instead and to not worry about the original variable. So if we open up that example, my mouse keeps hiding on me, it's very annoying. Um, but anyway, so if we open that back up and we run it, you're gonna see that it's going to be fine. There we go. And that's because we're using shadowing. So what shadowing does is it basically says, hey, here's a variable, but now here's another one. Go get the value of the original variable, 10, and then add one to it, and now here's a variable. And then it ignores this one whenever we reference variable because this reference to variable is stronger. And I'm not sure if I should have used the word reference there, so pardon me if you actually know what I'm talking about here. Um, so yeah, shadowing is very useful though because it allows you to keep these immutable variables while changing them and not making them mutable, which becomes important with concurrency. So as you can see, works just fine, and we'll move on. So shadowing is different from using mutable because we are indicating that we want to make transformations, but we still want to keep it immutable. And so we're essentially declaring a new variable, and we're just changing. And so that means that we can do anything. We could change the type of the variable, and Rust won't care. So it's not exactly the same, um, but for very simple applications, it has a lot of the same uses but for more complex ones, this matters a lot. All right, we're about to start up our first set of poll questions. So let me start up the bot. All right, um, here we go. been a while since I've used the bot so give me bear with me uh, that is not the uh, correct poll there we go okay so poll question one what should I check if I have a question about rust I already know what someone is about to say Bot did disappear. Oh, that's interesting. Bot did disappear again. All right, let's try that again. Okay, bot might be confused. All right, let me try it again. I'm rebooting it. Well, I'm not rebooting it, but. There we go, okay. Bot is back. Someone's got the right idea about uh, where to go with Rust. All right, so I will give another moment here. That's interesting. Okay, uh, I will give it another few seconds here. All right, so the first question, the answer is uh, not one, believe it or not. It's not two because that's a different kind of Rust. It's three and or four. So the best answer is three because the documentation is gonna be your best location, your best friend, but four is also correct. If you want to use Stack Overflow, you can feel free to do so. That's totally fine. Uh, yeah, it looks like it was a near 50-50 split with one person going with Eustace. Eustace is not someone you should ask about Rust unless uh, apparently the internet has died. So, poll question two. This is actually, don't answer that one. 
create four Q, no, five Q, two. There we go. Okay. So what command will check if code will compile and create an executable but not run the code? That's a good question. You'd have to find them on campus. So I'll give everyone another few seconds here. Okay, so it looks like it was about a 50-50 split between four and two. So keep in mind that cargo build is actually going to oh I see I see what's going on um, yeah so cargo 4 is correct so what command will check if code will compile and create an executable so this is a little bit of a trick question but 2 is also sort of right in that you would understand the point but 4 is correct because we're asking if it creates an executable as well but doesn't run the code so yeah Cargo build is the correct answer for this one. All right, we have a true false question with the third answer because why not? This is a true or false question. I don't know what you're talking about. A good question <laughs> so yeah these are fair points um yeah there there is no reason why I put three on there I just kind of wanted to so I did um but yeah three is definitely wrong uh, so it looks like someone did put three which I'm not surprised by but why should I be at this point um yeah so the correct answer is two because an immutable variable is just that. It is not mutable. Mutable is equivalent to being changed. So yeah, uh, for whoever put three, I don't know how you got there, but okay. <laughs> um, sure, uh, let's move on to poll question four now. So how can we define immutable variable? All right, I'll let the votes trickle in a little bit more. Okay, so the uh, correct answer for this one, so it looks like everyone got it correct. It is three, it's let mute x equal and then whatever you want it to set it equal to. So that is correct. I, I see what, okay, fair point. I didn't say in Rust, but that was the implied answer. Um, but yeah, so three is correct in this one. So data types, all values in Rust are a specific data type. And this is very important because it has very big implications. So this allows a language to know how much space it needs to allocate and how to work with the data, right? And you'll learn more about this in CS233 where you learn about what uh, space each thing needs. But basically the idea is that certain data needs certain spaces, right? You only need a zero or one or one bit for a Boolean whereas a character needs four bits. 
And so that's something where it's going to become very important. Now, you don't need to specify the type when declaring a variable because the compiler is super smart and will infer what type the variable is. And that's why you're able to do let instead of whatever type you need. So there are a few different types. The first set is scalar types. And so these uh, represent a single value. So Rust has four primary scalar types, integers, floating points, booleans, and characters. So if we look at integers, integers are whole numbers, otherwise meaning they have no decimal part. We can use signed, positive and negative, or unsigned, positive only. And so if you're doing something where you know, like you're indexing an array where you know you'll never have a negative number, it's actually better to go with unsigned because you won't have to deal with uh, using as much space as you would with a signed integer. So let's take a look at the scalar types for integers. So there's a bunch of them, and if we look at this diagram, you can see all of the major ones. So there's anything from 8-bit all the way up to 128-bit, and then there's arch, and we'll talk about arch in a minute. So if you have 8-bit um, signed and unsigned, you'll notice that the only difference is i versus u, and we'll talk about that in a minute. So here we go. So the number following the letter is the number of bits we use to represent the number. And this is, once again, something you'll learn more about in CS233. But basically, i with an n after it, any sort of number, so that could be i8, i128, whatever. It, that means that we can represent numbers from negative 2 to the n minus 1 to 2 to the n minus 1, i uh, minus 1 inclusive. And the reason for that minus 1 is because we also have to be careful to store 0. So if we're looking at i8, that means we can go from negative 128 to 127. So that is an assigned integer, but if we want an unsigned integer, we use u, and that means we can go from 0 to 2 to the n minus 1. And this means that we can have anything from 0 to 255. So you can see with the same 8 bits, we can now index an extra 128 locations in an array. And finally, arch depends on your machine and it will choose whatever is appropriate. So a 32-bit machine will use 32 bits, a 64-bit machine will use 64 bits, and if 8-bit machines still existed, it, was, it would use 8 bits. So, uh, not necessarily. Basically, use whatever you need. Um, the question was, does this mean I, I have to start memorizing powers of 2? Not really. You'll usually just go with uh, the arch and we'll talk about that in a minute and that will cover most cases. So floating points are a little bit different and that's because floating point numbers can't really be stored using a binary and that's because if you think about it right there's not really a good way to store that binary number uh, or that floating point number with the decimal after it using binary. So what we use is floating point numbers and so it allows us to get similar speed, high pre precision, but it's going to be a little bit different. And so on most modern computers, you'll be able to use F64, which is a 64-bit floating point, but some computers you'll have to use float32. So you also have the numerical op operations you'll usually have. So you have addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, and modulus, which is the remainder of division. And so there you go. You have all of your basic operators. Let's talk about Booleans. Booleans in Rust are specified using the bool keyword, and bools can be either true or false. I know, crazy, right? Uh, we can hold one Unicode scalar value uh, using a character, and we use single quotes to represent a single character and double quotes for a string. Crazy idea, I know, definitely new. Um, in case you can't tell, I'm being a little bit uh, sarcastic. Since Rust uses Unicode, though, you can actually hold more than just you would be able to using ASCII. You can actually have accented characters, you can have Chinese characters, Korean characters, even emojis, which is super cool with Rust. And so you can also have data uh, of compound types. So you can have multiple different types in one thing, and that would be in a tuple. So tuples are a compound type that can hold several different things in a single variable and tuples have a fixed length. So if we look at this example, 
we have a tuple, we have the character A, we have two, and then we have a floating point number. So we have an, an integer and a floating point, and you can see what we can do is we can actually destructure that tuple to create three different variables using that one tuple and then access them. So destructuring is really useful if you need to do calculations using those uh, individual things and you want to separate them uh, in an easy way. However, you can also you, uh, access them by, uh, oh, actually this is the output. So yeah, in this example you see the output is pretty standard. It's exactly what you expect. However, you can also access them as you would by putting a tuple, dot, and then whatever index you have. So instead of brackets, you would use a dot. So those are tuples. So arrays, arrays are another compound data type in Rust, and the important thing is that they are fixed length. This is similar to how arrays are in Java, unlike array lists, and they can only hold values of the same type, unlike tuples. And we can create them using commerce separated lists and square brackets, similar to how we would in Python. And we'll talk about vectors later, which are similar to array lists, and they can grow, grow and shrink in size. So here we have three different types of array, arrays. We have the character array that holds A, B, C, D, and that's a pretty simple one. Then what we have is one where we specify how long it is, and that is that we say we have five U32s. So this is five unsigned 32-bit integers. And there we go, we have all of them. So now we have let array equal, and then we have an emoji, which I know everyone is loving now that I've told you about emojis in Rust. We have an emoji, and then we say we want five of them. And so if we look at the output, here we go, you'll see that the final one gives us all the emojis. So yeah, we have all kinds of different things. The one important thing to notice is that instead of using the simple brackets that we would earlier, we use this colon and then a question mark to print out the entire array. And that's a really simple debug feature that's super nice to use. So we also have uh, another way to access that, and that's just by accessing them as you would in any other language. So compound types with arrays continued. If we have an index, we can try to index something and it will compile even if it's out of index or out of the array's size. So if we try to index the 200th element of this array, which doesn't have 200 elements, we're gonna get an error. And yeah, here we go. Index out of bounds, the len is five, but the index is 200, which is obviously bad. So control flow. We use conditionals to, wow, I am really far behind, but we're gonna catch up. Um, so we use conditionals to choose what code runs based on the current values. And so they're just if statements. This probably looks familiar to you if you've used Python or uh, Java. The only difference is you don't have the parentheses. And so you do not need a semicolon at the end either. So here is a simple if statement. And if we run it, you'll get the number is greater to, um, greater than or equal to five and less than 10. Okay, so control flow with conditionals. You can also set an if statement to a variable. So uh, we'll see that with loops in a minute. So here's a loop, and so this looks different, so you might want to pay attention. So a loop will just repeatedly run sections of code and then jump back up to the top, and so you'll need to uh, actually break out of it. So to do that, let's take a look at this slide. We have let mute x equal to 10, because remember, we need a mutable variable to do this. Then we say while, so we have a loop here, and each time that we run through this loop, we check if x is less than five, we break out of the loop and then print it out. So that means that when we print it out, we're gonna get four, and that's because we're incrementing by two in this loop. Now we can also use the loop to assign a value to the variable. So we can say, uh, and this code is actually wrong, that should be a y. Um, I'll open it up in the playground because that will be correct. Um, in this loop, I think it's down here, yep. So that should be an X, there we go. Um, you'll see we say let X equal zero, and then in this loop, we wait until X is greater than or equal to 10, and then we break and return X times 10. So that's why we're getting 100. And so this loop is pretty 
interesting because it's actually putting the value into a variable and remember when we're doing that we're going to need a semicolon which you only need when you're assigning it to a variable if you don't do that you don't need that okay so that's a loop and let's talk about while wow loops they're very similar to loops except they put that condition inside the loop for you so here's an example we say while wow, x mod 7 is not equal to 0 we print this and run x minus 1 however there is an error in this code I'll let anyone see if they can find it before I hit run. The answer is that this code isn't going to work because X is not mutable. So if we put mute, we're going to see all of a sudden it's going to work and there we go, X is, and then it gives us all the different values of X down to the one that escapes loop. So yeah, that is that. Um, we added mute. All right, let's talk about for loops. So you're probably used to for loops that allow you to iterate over a collection of values. Um, and it's pretty generalized and you can do them for, or you can use them for a lot of different things. And I am for some reason lagging using Google Slides. So we're gonna cover the index for loop and the for each loop. So you're probably used to something like this. This is what's known as a C style loop. And so a C style loop is basically a for loop that has an initializer, a check for each time you start the loop, and then an incrementer. And yeah, you've probably seen this in Java. So here's what you do in Rust. So what we say is we're going to do something i times. And so i is going to be 0 up to but not including 10. So these are the same loop, just written in different languages. So the bottom one is a C style loop that you probably see in Java. The top one is the one that you would see in Rust. So what we can do is we can actually use that to go through a collection. So let's take a look at that. So we create an array and we have four X in zero dot dot five. So that'll print zero through four. And then we have uh, four a variable in an array and then we create dot iter. And what dot iter will do is iterate over that array. And so it will allow you to print every item in that array. And if we open up the play round, you'll see we get everything in the array twice, A, B, C, D, E, A, B, C, D, E. So those are two different ways to do for loops. It depends on your preference. So functions. I know I'm going a little bit faster, but I'm almost caught up on slides. We're almost done. Um, so you're probably used to functions that look like this, and they have a return type and a name and then two parameters, and then they return. So this is a function that you would see that doesn't have anything else. Um, and then they, they're both C style. If we look at Rust though, what we do is we have function fn, the name, the variable, the type, and then another variable, another type. And then we have this arrow looking thing which returns i32. And what this tells us is this function adds the first number which is in uh, i32 and a second number which is an i32 and returns it as an i32. And all it does is return those two numbers. And you'll notice you don't even have to put return so long as you don't have a semicolon. So yeah, uh, we don't specify the return type at the start. We actually put it at the end. And we specify input by putting the type after the name. And the return, we don't need to explicitly use the keyword return. We can just put the value at the end of our function and just not have a semicolon. But you can also put this where you have a return and a semicolon at that. So here's a function that does nothing in Rust. It's just fn, the name, parentheses, and then inside. Instead of putting void, you just don't have anything on the end. So here are a couple examples of functions. I'll let you take a look at them for a moment. Pretty self-explanatory. This one does nothing except for print hello world. And then these two will both add numbers. The only difference is how they return. So there's the output, so you'll see hello students, and then 196, 196, because we're printing hello world, and then we add a couple of numbers. So comments, and yeah, we are almost done with slides, so don't worry. Um, sorry I'm going a little over on time, and sorry that this has been a little bit faster towards the end. Uh, comments are lines of text in your code that the compiler will ignore, just like in other languages. Comments in Rust, unlike, unlike in Python, comments in Rust will start with slash slash. So this green comment is an example of that.
All right, we made it. We've got a few poll questions, and then we are good for today. Uh, poll create. Okay, here is question one. I'm putting the poll bot up now. Python actually is not the only language to use hashtags. Don't worry, this is actually the last language that we're covering, I'm pretty sure. Um, yeah, this is pretty much it for the rest of the semester. Uh, we have only just uh, Rust left, and we're just going to talk about Rust in different ways. So what will this code print? I'll give everyone another couple seconds here. All right, I'm going to close the bot. All right, so everyone put two, and two is the correct answer. So great job, everyone. Let's go to question five, or question six. So yeah, what is the value of variable going to be? And this one might take a second. All right, let me know if you need any more time. Otherwise, I'm going to close up the poll. Okay. So it looks like 75% of you put four, which is the correct answer. And then another 25% of you put three, which is incorrect. And so the reason for that is that you have to keep in mind that this loop is going to break after it's at 25, but it's not going to happen until it goes through 25. So it's actually going to be 30, right? Because if counter is greater than 25. So you've got to keep in mind that it's going to go at 25 and then above because it has to go through the loop one more time before it will be above. And so that's why it's 60 instead of 50. And here's our final poll question of the day. Poll create. So this question is, what is the return type of the following function? All right, I'll give everyone another few seconds here. All right, I am going to close up the poll. Okay, so everyone put three, and three is the correct answer. It is an unsigned 128-bit uh, function, or return value. So yeah, that's all the slides I had for today. I'm gonna stick around for another few minutes. Sorry for going three minutes over on lecture time and kind of going a little fast through the second half of the through the uh, lecture, but hopefully the, uh, the content is still there and you'll be able to watch the VOD and just kind of catch up on that. But yeah, hopefully that went well. I'm going to stop the recording and answer any questions.